Sorry I made everybody late here tonight. Thank you so much for being here this evening. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to come back to you once again and preach the gospel to you. Uh, it's been a while. It seems like there's been uh, several things that's been happening in the past month, and uh, it seems like there'll be more that's going to come happen in the month of June as well. And uh, I would just ask, really, uh, on behalf of the prayers for, from you guys, that uh, things will go well. I'm going to be traveling a lot, and uh, um, you probably think I travel a lot now. Wait till you see the month of June, I'll tell you what the mileage is at the end of the month. So, uh, And this is really a month for me, personally, to be better at things. Uh, I'm going to a clinic to better myself as a basketball official. I'm going to a clinic to hopefully become a better softball umpire as in college level. And also, I'm going to be here next week. And even at my age, and I don't want to be one of those guys that repeats his age every time he gets up in the pulpit, but, uh, I'll, but I, even as long as I've been doing this and as long as I've been trying to do this, let's put it that way, I still need to be better. I still want to reach out to individuals and I'll take any information I can get to be that way. It's the same way with officiating. It's the same way as a Christian. It's no different as an evangelist. So I would encourage if there's individuals here that want to just be just a little bit better, even if we just give a slither of information from Mr. Ping on how to improve spreading the gospel, why not come and, and try to improve ourselves? Um, so I, uh, hopefully me and Trenton both will be up. I have... I, uh, hopefully we'll be talking to him to see if he wants to ride together and um, I think it's going to be encouraging for all of us to have the opportunity to hear these things that Mr. Ping has to say um, remember my son Carter in your prayers that's why I wasn't here last Sunday he graduated from school and the reason why a majority of them are not with me tonight is because his girlfriend uh, graduated from school too she went to St. Mary's he went to Williamstown um, she's a very, well, I, I thought she was a very smart girl. She's a Val Victorian, but for some reason she's dating Carter. So I, I just, uh, I haven't figured that one out yet. So, um, but, uh, you know, Allison, if you're listening, I hope nothing but the best for you and, and, uh, hope that you'll change your mind. So, <laughs> but, uh, she is a very fantastic girl. She's, she's very smart and she was, uh, very, uh, uh, very active in track and field at her school. So. Uh, so I'd ask you to remember the prayers of them. Pray for uh, Tracy's mom. She's going to have surgery this week. There's just a lot of things that's coming along, and uh, it's going to be an interesting month in June. So, um, And you guys have my prayers as well as we continue uh, to work together here in the evenings to preach the gospel. But the message I have here tonight, I don't know about a lot of preachers, and hopefully Mr. Pink can help me out with this next month or uh, next week when we talk. We have sermon block, or at least I have something called sermon block. And what that is, is the opportunity to bring something that's encouraging and edifying to you. And hopefully I could do that every week. And I, I, I thank you for always the kind responses on when I do bring something to the table. But anybody that has ever stayed up in this pulpit to preach the gospel knows that that isn't easy. And uh, I had a joke tonight about how bored was you with the boring sermon this morning. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's not easy to come up here in a big audience and try to bring people closer to Christ. And so I got this block going on right now. So Sunday night I went to a congregation where this man, the first time he's ever preached in the pulpit, he brought up 1 Samuel chapter 17, the battle of David and Goliath. And he read all 57... <laughs> Either 57 or 58 verses of 1 Samuel chapter 17. He read all these verses and then he brought up 10 points. And I thought it was a pretty good sermon for it being his first time. And, and Joel, if you're listening, I thought that was a very excellent sermon. I even told him after service, I said, it's stolen. So, uh, and I said, I, I'd like to try to present this. I really presented this all day. And I hope that you'll enjoy this. I hope you'll be encouraged by this. And some of the things that he just brought to me, it's not that I think I could do this better or I think that, uh, that it needs improvement. I thought it was good enough to tell other people about it. That's, that's 
when it comes to sermon stealing, it's not trying to one-up somebody. I just think it's really that good, even in the short time he did it, that it was good and it needs to be told again. And, and, um, and that's what we need to do with the young audience that we have and people that are young evangelists to help them with these things. And let me tell you the things. that His name is Joel Main, and he's at Mary Reno. And I just want to tell you the 10 points that he brought up. And, of course, I'll put my little insight on, but I hope you'll be encouraged by it. Um, some of the things that he brought up, he brought up these 10 points. And one of those points that he reminds us here is sometimes our adversaries are huge. Last Sunday, I brought out this statement after I read uh, this uh, story about this individual that did a speech called Make Your Bed. And he brought this out to the University of Texas. I think it was back in 2014. He's a four-star admiral. And one of the things that he brought up is if we can't do the small things, how are we ever going to do the big things that's going to be the challenge in our life? And I, I rephrased it a little bit in a spiritual perspective. And I said, if we don't commit to our Lord, even in the smallest of daily challenges, we can't expect to be fully committed to the Lord when we deal with the more difficult tasks ahead. And that's true. And sometimes we don't think that we deal with big problems, and we most certainly do. And unfortunately, we don't handle them as well as we can. Now, let me, refer let me say that again. We don't handle the huge adversaries as well as we can. Sometimes we handle them, we handle them totally wrong. And sometimes we handle them, and we go to a point where we just don't want to deal with it at all. And brethren, as long as Satan is here in this world, we must be mindful that we are going to have adversaries. And some days, those problems are going to be difficult. Sure, there is going to be things that we deal with that is easy to overcome. And sure, there's going to be situations that we deal with that are going to be a challenge. But we know at the end, we're going to be victors. But how about the challenges, brethren, when they come to us and we don't know if we're going to win and we don't know when the battle is going to end? How well are we willing to handle it? I want you to think about when it comes to Goliath. As one of us already read there, says there came out from the camp of, uh, of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was uh, armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was five shekels of, or five thousand shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And every time we think about Goliath, the first thing that comes to our mind is how tall he is. We don't talk about how big of a man he is. Some make the argument that he's about 450 pounds. And that 450 pounds is not a fat man. That's a fit man. And we don't talk about how this individual, how this big man that comes before uh, the army of, of Saul, how this guy is ready to fight. We don't talk about how scary this individual is it's not just his stature but he is ready for war he is ready to battle if you ever have an opportunity to look at the book of judges it's very interesting that god wanted his people to witness war to realize war to experience war because they will have to go against these individuals in battle and God reminds us this in the book of Judges, and we can see how these individuals have to realize they're going to go against individuals that are very huge adversaries. The one thing I took out of the, out everything about this, I put a picture up here about just his spear. And if you look there in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 7, it goes into a very lengthy detail about his spear. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And if anybody has ever done any knitting and stuff, you got an idea how big a weaver's beam can be. And then it says his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron from his shield bearer, and his shield bearer went before him. 600 sh shekels of iron. If we put a standard weight to it today, 
It's about 160 pounds. And I, if I could make a kind of a parallel to maybe just guys like us, maybe you go to Lowe's and you pick up a bag of Quickcrete. A bag of Quickcrete, not the 40 pound ones, not the small one, guys, the big one, is about 80 pounds. Now you got two bags of Quickcrete that's on top of that spear. And that spear is not designed to throw from here to Harold. It is for distance. And that guy has enough strength and enough power to take 160 pounds and not including the beam and launch it. And my point is this. We use the analogy all the time in sports when we talk about David and Goliath. And we talk about how when it comes to these underdog stories, we love to talk about the little guy winning. We love to talk about the small school that beat the big college town. We love to talk about these guys that have no shot to win and they become victors and we enjoy and we embrace these stories. But maybe, brethren, we need to take a very stronger approach to our spirituality in that same manner. Because, brethren, I am sick and tired, just like you, hearing of how evil this world is. And I am sick and tired of hearing about how this evil world is always winning. And we, that's all we do is just talk about it. And, brethren, we seem like we constantly say, this is an evil world we're living in today. Brethren, it was an evil world back in the day of Judges. And I would make a very strong argument in the back of the day of Judges. It was worse. But brethren, when it comes to the challenges and these huge adversaries, we must be able and willing to take on the battle. And this goes to my next point. When we don't put our faith in these things, if we don't put our faith in God, terror will follow. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, where we see that the Philistine says, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul, and Saul is not a small man by any means, some will make the argument that, the, that King Saul is about the same height, not the same size as me. <laughs> he is, as 1 Samuel chapter 9 says, he's head and shoulders above the rest. He is a tall individual. And this individual, when he heard the words of this Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Why is that? That this mighty king is afraid. Could it be that when we read back in the past few chapters that God's not really with him right now? Remember, he took the spoils from the Amalekites. He spared King Agag. He also done some other things that God did not like either. And if you look there, I think it's in chapter 15, it says God left his kingdom. And when you don't have God on your side, you better be afraid. Because all you can rely on is you and, and all your strength and all your knowledge and all your might can't stand against the things if you don't have God on your side. It will only last so long. You know, everybody talks about how LeBron James just can't do the things that he did 20 years ago. Yeah, people will get worse as they age. But when we have God on our side, it doesn't matter how old we are or how bad our knees get or, or how we can't run like we used to. I told them about Summer Shindig. I said, please get me an ambulance this year because I don't want to have to go to the hospital again. And just make it just, you know, let's just cut out the middleman. But it doesn't matter when we become older if we have God on our side because we're not focusing on this body anymore. We're focusing on that heavenly hope. And we should. But man, brethren, how many times have we seen individuals when it comes to some deathly diagnosis that they have, that there is fear in their hearts and it's because God is not on their side. We can't make that statement to live as Christ and to die as gain because we don't have the faith in God in us or the faith in Christ. 
So don't be surprised, brethren, if we don't have faith in God, it should not surprise us that we'll be afraid. Also, keep this in mind too. Life continues, and sometimes our adversaries continue as well. And what I mean is this, there's always going to be problems. I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but brethren, as long as Satan is around, problems will come along. Maybe not as bad as some situations, and sometimes maybe worse in some situations. But be sure that as we are trying to have this heavenly hope, and we are striving to be with God, Satan is going to try to do the best he can to take us down. Look how David reminds us here about some of the things that he has to deal with, and now he is going to deal with Goliath. Because David said to Saul, he says, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. And he has the faith, and we'll talk about faith properly placed here in a second, that he believes that this will be no different with this Philistine. And I will also venture to say this, brethren, that this battle that David is going against with Goliath will not be his hardest battle that he, have to, he will have to deal with in his life. I don't think it's a drop in a bucket compared when he becomes king and he has to take on the challenges of being a ruler. And he will have to take on the challenges when he makes mistakes. He will have to pay for the sins that he has committed to his people. And some people will die over that. Look when he numbered, numbered the people and God said, don't do that. Think about his son Absalom that wanted to take over his kingdom. Drove him out. And then when he retained his kingdom, his son is dead. You think the Goliath is a challenge? Yeah, it may be a challenge, but it's not compared to what he has to deal with later on. I had a lady this past week on social media just talked about, once again, this evil in this world and, and how people are in, in this day and age. And I said, could it be that maybe it's not that it's gotten worse, but we just come to realize it a lot more, how evil this world is. Because there's things that's happened when I was a young man or a child that I didn't know anything about until I got older. Or I didn't know how evil some individuals were until I got a lot older. I think sometimes, brethren, we don't come to the realization of the evil that has existed in our world because we don't come to the realization of it until we get mature. And we have to understand, brethren, that as we continue on as Christians, problems will be there. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to take on these things head on? Or are we going to be scared? Or are we going to be fearful? Or are we going to be like Saul because we, don't, we know that God is not on our side at this time? Because one of the things you'll see that's very interesting is when faith is applied, confidence follows. Look here in verses 36 and 37 where you see that he has this confidence about these lions and bears. He says, This uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he is the father of the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That is great confidence, brethren. And we must understand that uh, I look at David and maybe we got that mental picture that he is not this tall individual. He is not this strong individual. He is a young, good-looking guy, but we don't look at him as someone that can take on the world. But brethren, do we have confidence? 
that when we can talk to somebody about our faith, we can boldly talk about it. I used to use this example constantly when I was a young preacher. If I stood up here and made a bold proclamation to some of you Steelers fans that I don't think the Steelers has never been a very good football team, ever, I guarantee that somebody's going to stop me before I walk out that door. Nathan's putting up six fingers for some reason. But I guarantee somebody is going to have a very strong argument against it. There was a guy at one of the congregations at Elk Fort. There was a guy that would, uh, he played bluegrass music. He loved bluegrass music. And if I told him that bluegrass music is not music at all, I don't think I'd be able to leave that congregation alive. <laughs> But you think about something that you are passionate about and you have the utmost confidence about and you have the utmost knowledge about and you will fight me to the bitter end to contest for the things that you believe in. And brethren, that is no problem because we should do the same thing when it comes to this confidence of this faith that we have in Christ Jesus. And we should be able to talk about this and we should be able to do this, not meekly and, and, and timid, but we should be boldly, like in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, let us boldly, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of God, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. Can you have that confidence to talk about that with somebody? Because sometimes, brethren, we may not have the support that we need. And sometimes that, that may not be family. If you look here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard David spoke to the men because he asked, he says, what is going to be of this uncircumcised Philistine? And Eliab said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, the evil in your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You know, one of the things, he's kind of half right here if you think about it. Because remember, David wanted to build a temple. Why not? Why wasn't it him? Because he loved bloodshed. His brother knew it. I just thought that was interesting from my study. But his brother has done nothing just to bring him down now. You are a shepherd. You are a young man. You are not a soldier. The only reason you come down here is to see violence. Discouragement from the world is one thing. And maybe we can handle that pretty well. And maybe sometimes when it comes to discouragement from our own brethren, Sometimes that is very difficult, but sometimes we can even handle that. But brethren, I cannot truly understand when it becomes the individuals that are flesh and blood that have put you down and have separated yourselves from you because you follow a true and living God. Here this individual is contesting his faith against these Philistines and the only thing his brother is willing to do is to shut him down. I don't know about a lot of the brethren here in this congregation, but I truly can understand when it comes to struggles with family who do not believe in the same things that you do. I told a story this morning of how some of my family members believe my wife brainwashed me because I decided to follow God. And what they don't really realize is if you really want to blame someone from brainwashing me, you might want to go back to my grandparents. They're the ones that started taking me to church first. <laughs> but here is the thing, brother, and sometimes we see people have a stereotype. And sometimes when it comes 
to trying to take on the challenges of your faith, sometimes your biggest obstacle, and Jesus warns us of this, will be those of their own family. And it's not just the, the extreme divide, it is also the small divide over little things that will cause heartache. And sometimes we don't want to deal with heartache of family. And sometimes when we love someone that much, we don't want to deal with those kind of pressures, so we submit. But Jesus gives us this warning. And don't let anything take you down. Even family can't offer you something long term. They can offer you just what everybody else can offer you. Temporal. But Christ has promised us something that lasts eternal. And if our family does really have this concern for our well-being, they're not going to want us to make it. We talked about graduation. We wanted our children to graduate. We want them to graduate from high school. We want them to graduate from college. We want them to graduate from a trade school. We want them to succeed, and we want our children to be better than us. And we strive for it. I don't want Shay or Carter or Peyton to ever have to go through the things that their mom and dad had to go through. And there's nothing wrong with that. But brethren, I also want them to be a stronger spiritual leader than I could ever have been. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Let's understand that sometimes when it comes to our challenges in our faith, sometimes we're not going to get the support what we need. But be rest assured, if we're doing the things according to God, there is someone that is on your side. That's God. Take an opportunity. Just, just find a statement. I am with you in the Holy Scriptures. Find that statement. You can do it all kinds of ways. You can do it at Google. You can do it through the Bible app. No matter the case may be, look at that statement. I am with you. And see who says this. And see who supports you in this. It's God. And don't forget the battles that the Lord helped you with. Look there at 1 Samuel chapter 30, 17, verse 36 and 37. David is mindful that God has helped him before. God will help him again. I always talk about that thing that happens at Pittsburgh when they get ready for a game in baseball. They do this kind of service announcement, announcement says, don't be that guy. They just don't want you to be obnoxious when you're being a fan. They don't want you to curse. They don't want you to do things that just ruins everybody else's game. And it says, don't be that guy. I would encourage you, don't be like Elijah. Don't be the individual that has been rewarded by God's blessings to help an individual be risen from the dead. Don't be the individual when he has to take on the prophets of Baal and not only one, but really kind of curb stomp them when it comes to burning or sacrifice. Don't be like Elijah when he is supposed to find something to eat and he has found food. God has made sure that they can not only eat for just a little time, but a long time. And then the one thing that comes along that has brought you down, you say, let me die. And that's another example where God says, I'm with you. We are really quick to give up on God when it doesn't go our way. And we quickly forget of all the other things that we have prayed to God for it to happen and has. 
I don't know about you, but I have been blessed by God. There has been times I've asked God for things to happen, and it has happened. And But there's also been times I've asked God for things, and it did not happen. Does that mean I should stop doing this? Let me tell you something personal. And I apologize for being lengthy. I think I've told Nathan and a couple other guys about this. There was a time years ago <laughs> that I wanted to preach at this one particular congregation. And I mean, I really tried my heart out. Carter was probably a baby then. That gives you an idea how long it's been. <laughs> And I really tried my heart out to try out this congregation. And I just kind of just waited by the phone like that boy who's waiting for that girl to call. I was just waiting by the phone, hoping to get this call, get this call. And they said, yes, we want you to be our next preacher. But what happened is I told Tracy, I said, call them, find out if they made a decision yet. And they said, no, we don't want you. And I pouted like a baby for the next two days. <laughs> And I thought, why can I get this? But here's the funny thing, brethren. <laughs> it's hindsight's 2020. Things are a lot better now than what it was if I would have took that job. That's just the bottom line. Sometimes we got to wait for things to kind of work through. Sometimes our patience and our long suffering has to be enacted in order to come to realize that maybe that wasn't a good idea after all, Jay. <laughs> Maybe God was helping me, even though I didn't think he was helping me at all. Brethren, sometimes we need to ask ourselves just that. When it doesn't go the way we want it planned, ask ourselves, is there something that's coming along that will be better for me? Don't forget that God is there for you. Also, don't overload yourself. Take what you need. One of the things that's interesting is David only has on him this sling and five smooth stains. And some would make the argument, why did he need five if he had faith enough to only have one? And some made the argument that if you continue on in 2 Samuel chapter 21, Goliath had four brothers. Or at least there's some relation there because there's four individuals from of Gath that David also has slain. <laughs> Some people believe that's the reason why he had five stones, because he thought he had to face four others. That's just hodgepodge. But think about that situation where Saul is trying to help him go to battle, and the things that he comes to battle with what he needs is not what he needs. <laughs> he tried to test on his sword and his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. He says, I can't go with these. I have not tested them. So David put them off. And this may come to individuals that have done Bible studies here. But there's been times where individuals, I believe, have probably went 20 plus hours in one week to probably try to prepare maybe even a half chapter of a Bible study that they're going to do on Sunday or Wednesday night. And they try to get all this information. They try to just overload themselves with all this information. And no matter how much you have studied and how much you have tried to bring this all together to bring in a Bible study, there will be that one individual that will ask you a question that you, can't, you don't have the answer for. <laughs> And it makes you look like you haven't studied at all. <laughs> Brother, sometimes we do just that. Instead of trying to bring to the table something that will build up and encourage it, if you do have that question, tell them you'll save it for next week. You try to take all this knowledge that you spent 20 plus hours during the week to bring out to individuals, and it doesn't do anything to build up or edify. I've been guilty of it. Maybe you've had that preacher that has all kinds and he's a plethora of information. And he is 
interesting to listen to the things that he has studied and took time to study. But when it comes to being built up and encouraged, it doesn't bring a drop in the bucket for it. When you go to battle, we're going to talk about this here in just a second. When you go to battle, don't overload yourself with information that is pointless, that is useless, and it doesn't bring anything to bring this individual closer to God. Don't overload yourself. Understand who your enemies defy. If you look how David talks to this individual, he tells him, he says, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. David is making a stand. And he knows what the Philistines are all about. And he also knows that this is going to be a battle. It's not going to be something where we can have a draw. There is going to be a loser in this. And they're going to take on this challenge. And the things that I find interesting when it comes to our challenges in this spiritual warfare we have today. We have a problem. And we have a scripture. And the problem with these two is not within themselves. It's taking this problem and taking this scripture and bring it to a point where it brings an individual closer to God. An obvious problem with obvious scripture and we don't have an obvious approach. And we don't have an obvious solution. We don't get to know our enemy. Instead, we just say, you're doing this, this is what the Bible says, and we leave it at that. And maybe that's good for some, but it's not good for everyone. The Apostle Paul, if you find when he goes into the synagogue, look how he says he reasons with the Scripture. Wednesday nights, I go to a congregation over in, over in Ohio, and right now, we are studying groups of churches, denominations. And the approach in our study is a lot different than probably what I would have done 15 or 20 years ago. And the reason being is this. You know all the things that some individuals may not be doing right. But did you ever ask yourself, how did they come to this point? How do you have a majority in this world today that have a strong belief in transubstantiation? And if you're saying, well, what does that mean? I'll tell you after services. But some people have a strong belief in this, and it's strong enough that back in the early times of the church, people became divided over it to a point that they have never had the opportunity to reconcile over it. The one thing, if you want to ask yourself what was one thing, from my study of the history of the church, if there was one thing that has divided the church over everything, it's that. Oh, well, sure, there's other things there. But when it came to having this kind of meeting with the churches, the one thing they cannot come to an agreement to was that issue. Now think about that. One thing that could stop all the problems, have the church united at this one particular time in history. If you want to know how to talk to someone about their faith without clobbering with a bunch of verses, understand, ask yourself and understand how did they get to this point? Why do they believe in a papacy? Why do they believe in the Book of Mormon? Why were they willing to blindly follow the Watchtower Society? Brethren, it's not ignorant people 
ignorantly following someone, they have their reasons just like you and I. But brethren, we got to understand if we want to get to a common ground, and that common ground is we all believe in God, and we all believe in Christ, and we all believe in the Bible. If you want to look at a Protestant world today, those three things we all can absolutely agree on. But then there's other things that come into play. We have to ask ourselves, how do we get to our enemy? How do we get to this individual? And how do, can we get them to understand what we need to be as Christians? And don't be afraid if we're wrong to own up to it. When we have the proper faith, and it's in its proper place, run to the battle. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. An a huge adversary a man of war towers over him and he's not crawling to the line. He's running at it. Now let me ask you, when it comes to our adversary, can we be like Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch and run and ask him, do you understand the things that you're reading? When we have the challenges of our faith, are you able to run to that battle? There is a guy on the internet, his name is Cliff Netchley. And hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct. If not, I can show you the whole name after services. But the thing I find very interesting in this particular individual, I'm not saying he's 100% right on everything, but the things that I have seen of this individual is impressive. And what he does is this. He is a man, probably, if he's not my age, he's probably a, lot old, a little bit older. And what he does is he'll go to college campuses. And he'll go into their place of debate, if you will. And he will talk Bible with them. And the interesting thing is when these students come to talk to him and... Uh, Many people will say, well, college is corrupt in our, our youth's minds. And wherever that case may be, and however you feel, that's fine. But the thing that I find interesting with, with Cliff is he is able to talk to these individuals, and these kids come to him. Sometimes they come to him with difficult questions. Sometimes they come to him very coarse and very abrupt and, and maybe even sometimes rude. And sometimes these individuals will come to him uh, and not realize that there's an individual that has this question that's apart from the thing that he has discussed with somebody else. But the thing I find interesting with him is he doesn't take it down to their level. When he has a discussion with these guys, he doesn't become coarse, he doesn't become rude, he doesn't become abrasive. He's able to have a discussion with them about things, and he's able to question him, them about things. And they're open to talk to him about these things. When we put our faith in that place, are we able to run to a battle like a college campus? Are you able to run into battle like a prison? Or like an addiction recovery place? Or like a library with individuals that want to talk about scriptural things, but they are from another denomination, they're from another congregation, they're from another thing, and they want to talk about spiritual things. Are you willing to join that conversation? Are you willing to run the battle? Brother, that's a challenge. We're not too far from schools here. We're not, too far from, uh, we're not too far from communities that do come together and have biblical discussions. Are you able to give an answer of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear, and you don't care who it is? 
Because they are worried about spiritual matters, and you are too. Will you be willing to run the battle? And finally, remember your father. It's interesting, when Saul asks about who this individual is, David does not really give his name. He gives his title. I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. He doesn't say his name is David. He wants him to know who his dad is. He's already contested who his heavenly father is. And he wants to know where that lineage comes from. That these individuals are striving to follow the heavenly father as well. When I first went for a job at True Value in Payton City, one of the things that I tried to use for me to get that job is I knew the boss knew my dad. So when I went in for the interview and he looked at my job, and at the time, I think I only had two jobs at the time, they were both at fast food restaurants, and I really wanted to work here because it wasn't fast food. And one thing I tried to bring up to him where I thought would give me some points was, I think you know my dad so-and-so. His eyes got real big and he says, that is your dad. <laughs> I said, yes, it is. And I got the job. It's interesting because in the identity crisis that we live in, we don't want to be known as somebody else's son, somebody else's brother, somebody else's sister. We don't want to be known for those things unless it benefits us. Then we have no problem in the world telling who our mom or our dad or our brothers and sisters are. And that's the same way we do sometimes with our faith. We only use it when it's convenient. We don't use it when it's inconvenient. When people do have objections about things that Christians shouldn't be doing. And we're afraid to apologize for other individuals for the way they act. But the only time we do when it comes to our faith, when we want to confirm that we are Christians, and when it's a matter of convenience. I said sometimes it's like a wallet. I carry a little wallet with, with a couple cards in it. And sometimes we use our faith just like our wallet. We only take it out when we need it. And when it's no longer of use, we put it back in. Brethren, that's not how the scriptures work. That's not how a child of God works either. We are not children that use God as a matter of convenience. We use God because we love him. And we're willing to do what he asks of us to do. There's a challenge I want to bring you here tonight. What will you do when it comes to your battles that you have to deal with? Your small battles, your big battles, whatever the case may be. When you have to take on the adversary this week, whether it's at school, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's with family, whether it's with friends, how are you willing to take on that battle? And trust me, sometimes that battle comes up when we least expect it. I always find it interesting. One story I, I recall was a lady was questioned about her faith in a Dollar General store checkout line. <laughs> Maybe the most inconvenient time as you're trying to get money out to pay for something, somebody asks about your faith. <laughs> sometimes those battles come when we least expect it. But we have the opportunity to work on some of these things tonight. Maybe it's through prayer. I have a friend listening right now. His name is John. And John just had open heart surgery. And I got to visit him late one night on Sunday evening. I went to his hospital. He's all upset. It's a, it's a man who has always took care of himself. Now all of a sudden, he's got to have open heart surgery because two of his aortas are fused together. And they have to stop his heart to separate. And it scared him to death. 
He was an umpire too. And his perspective on God got a lot better when he got off the operating table. While all the people assured him that this is a normal procedure, he was still fearful for his life. And while these guys did their job, and while these guys were best, best in, he went to Cleveland to do this, and, and I have no doubt in my mind that these individuals at the Cleveland Clinic know what they're doing, but yet his faith became stronger not in those individuals, but in God. Maybe we need that kickstart tonight. Maybe you need to pray about it. Maybe you need to repent of things. One more thing, and the lesson's yours. One of the things that I talked about this morning with, with a group of brethren at Cornerstone, we were talking about forgiveness. And I told them about the situation where I did something very horrible publicly in my life. And one of the things that they had discussion about is how to go about doing it. And one of the things I brought to them is this individual called me out on it, and he just said a very simple statement. You need to repent. And my mindset when it came to my repentance is I don't care what kind of fashion it has to be. If I had to stand in front of individuals and confess that I've done something wrong in a public nature and that makes things better, why not? Sometimes we think that, well, Jesus never talked about these things, but he kind of did. In the book of Acts, he kind of did. But even if this is a process that not only makes the individual feel a lot better with their own soul, but helps the congregation grow, why not? If I'm wanting to be penitent of my sins, why not? I'm going to do the fruit that meets for repentance. Maybe we need to do that here tonight. Maybe we need to be baptized in Christ. About a month ago, I got to baptize Peyton's girlfriend. I caught one. <laughs> but it was just after this serious discussion that we have about her soul's condition, why she wanted to do this. She said she didn't want to do it for Peyton. I was like, hey, more power to you. Because I don't want you to do it for Peyton either. I don't want you to do it for me either. I want you to do this because you were convicted that you want to follow Christ Jesus. And you find this example in the scriptures. This is one of the things that a child of God needs to do. And have no debate about it whatsoever. And the interesting thing when it came to Haley being baptized was that everybody came. And I'm not talking about just brethren at the congregation that they were worshiping on Sunday evenings. But her mom and dad came. Her grandparents from both sides came. Her aunt and uncle came. There was a moment that we could talk about these spiritual things of why we do these spiritual things. I, I do believe it brought people a little bit closer. But be mindful that even in baptism, our battle's not over. Remember Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, remain faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Those are the words that Jesus will tell John to scribe and tell the rest of the world that these are the things that we need to do. We have an opportunity to do it here right now. If we need to respond, won't you come while we stand?